Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast this evening. I am delighted to welcome Carl Bergstrom. So welcome to the podcast, mate. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for coming on. It's been a long time. Been a long time of me stalking you. We've gone all, we've gone all mediums. We've gone iMessage. We've gone emails. We've gone WhatsApp. <laughs> so thank you, for, thank you for putting up with me over the last year or so. But anyone that doesn't know who you are, Carl, just want to give us a bit of an introduction on yourself and uh, what you're currently doing. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm excited to be on. Uh, so I am born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, so west coast of, of Canada. I, I grew up there, uh, <clears throat> had a really keen interest in sports, but I actually didn't get into kinesiology until my third year of college at University of British Columbia. Uh, just got really interested in it, into training. I uh, ended up doing my master's there. Um, all, all, you know, over an eight year period seems like it, it's such a, a short window, but I, I ended up working in the private sector, working uh, in the, for the women's national team for, for soccer or football, whichever one we want to call it, uh, Vancouver Whitecaps, which is MLS, a uh, little stint, a uh, little contract with the Canucks, worked with all sorts of athletes. Um, and then uh, this is my third year with the uh, Golden State Warriors. So I've kind of had experiences in multiple different environments, professional or private, different sports, worked with all sorts of different environments, which is, you know, probably one of my favorite parts of my career. And now I've been fortunate enough to, to be here and, uh, and live, live in San Francisco and work with a really great group. So head performance coach, is that what you came in the organization as, or is that developed since then? No, I, I came in with that role. Okay. So yeah. you were coming into a, an extremely successful organization. How, how was that? That, that 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 was uh, that was a lot of fun uh different you know so coming from well we'll call it football football soccer coming from mls we had an incredible group the mls is just a different environment you know um a little bit smaller scale but everybody's very committed uh very structured um you know it wouldn't change anything there it was so great and then to come here where uh, it's one of the biggest organizations in the world sport um a tremendous amount of success the reality is is i when i came in i came in with uh, my mentor and director rick celebrini and jerry ramajita who were both actually from vancouver as well we came down and you know we we took a very conservative approach to not try to mess things up you know um just uh, sit back observe uh learn the landscape the environment um, build relationships and then try to uh, adapt our processes just to make sure that we could continue flowing versus coming in and try to uh, fix something that's not broken. I'm interested in how you got the how you got the job. I'm always interested yeah. in that them kind of stories. Is it a like sliding sliding doors moment or was it? It's um, you know coming back to the, the initial point. Every single environment that I've been in. Um, I've been really fortunate and I've really gone out of my way to meet good people. Um, people are really everything in, in our community and our strength and conditioning is, you know, it, it's so important in every environment, whether it's, you know, the Canadian national team with Cesar Milan, who was there and, and he, you know, what he provided me or with the Vancouver Whitecaps, you know, John Poley, um, who was the head fitness coach there. I always had people, you know, around me who I, I learned from and, and created really good uh, mentorship. And the person who, you know, is the biggest one there is Dr. Rick Celebrini, who you know, I've been working with him now for 10 years. Um, and we just, you know, ever since I started working with him, we had a, a good relationship and we were side by side. I even trained his, his kids a little bit because they're really good hockey players. And uh, when he was offered the director role, um, he offered me the position. And, and I was so grateful to be able to, you know, come out down here and, and try to build something special with him. But really came with um, our relationship and him trusting that I could, you know, come down here with him and, and be impactful. Interesting. So what, what is it? I mean, I've, I've spoke to people who are, who are working in the NBA and people who have got into the NBA and those that have, that have maybe left and gone to other sports. And it just seems crazy. Like schedule, <laughs> schedule, like the, the, the bright lights, the, the entertainment and you guys do that incredibly well over there mm -hmm. um but what is the environment really like for for you who's been there for a couple of seasons like how did you deal with all that that i've just explained in that in them first couple of months and yeah just give us a picture of what it's really like to work 
um, and an organization like you are? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It's uh, it's it's managing. The best way to put it is, is learning to manage a very complex and and uh, ever changing environment and, and adapting to it. Uh, coming from football, um, you know it's very structured. You you play once or twice a week. Um, you know the rhythm of training is a little bit more sustainable. You know if you have like a, a YTP and and how you want to load things, and of course you adapt depending on. on Playing styles, et cetera, et cetera, but there is a little bit more room for for structure. Um, coming to the NBA, like you know, if I'm going to paint a picture for you, um, I won't say this season because COVID's obviously changed things. But last year, from October 24th to April 15th, if we had played a full schedule, so under six months, we have 82 games, um, 12 back to backs, 59 flights. Um, we play on every major holiday, so Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, that's that's a big part of the league. So <laughs> it's very, very dense, and um, and the league does a really good job, and the players do a really good job in adapting, but you can't really understand it or feel it until you're in this environment, and, and there's so much more to it than just the physical demands on court, you know. So you might have players who don't play much or play two to – four to six minutes and, and you know, you want to push them and, and, and make sure that you're maintaining a certain quality of, of uh, sharpness. But the, even those guys, the, the amount of demand on them with travel, with, with media, with uh, their own brand, with their families, the, the people who are involved in their process privately, like there's a lot to consider. And so it, it, it can, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, but we were really fortunate when we came here. Um, it was my again Rick, who's the director of, uh, uh, of sports medicine performance, and then Dr. Jerry Ramajita, who's a, a performance therapist. When we came here, um, there was still half a staff intact, and they were they were excellent, you know, in onboarding us and welcoming us, and and basically giving us a, a an accelerated crash course on what the environment is going to be like. So that was like a blessing in disguise. Honestly, it was, it was very, 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 very um, useful. And, um, you know, it, in that, the group is amazing too. So, you know, th there are, I'm sure there are environments that, you know, perhaps aren't as positive, but I haven't been exposed to that. We have leaders who have incredible emotional intelligence, very welcoming, very open-minded, and, um, that also helped in the transition. Uh, I, I, was, I was speaking today, I'm, this is my third season and all three seasons are so incredibly different. I, I, I could never have pictured that, you know, our first year going to the finals and the average age probably being over 30 if you actually look at our, our roster and guys who had been established and, and understood the rhythm into our second year, which is a little bit more challenging. Also, um, you know, brand new roster, average age is 23 or 24, even younger, likely. Um, and then to this year where we're kind of a hybrid of the two and we're hungry and, and it's a lot of a new roster. It's just, it's very exciting and it, it's uh, it's never endless, like the, <laughs> the way that we have to adapt and, and evolve to the environment. What's, the, what's it like for you as a, as a person, as a coach and your, I suppose your well-being and your health, coach health, been, been, uh, big topic of conversation on the podcast and elsewhere how do you how do you manage that and how do the staff manage that is it she's smiling and laughing it's uh, i'm guessing it's an interesting one to so uh, rob have you heard have you heard of the freshman 15 from college uh, i don't yeah. think so okay so the freshman 15 in college is your first year you go to college in, in north america you, you put on 15 pounds just because you're away okay. from home and I had like the, the a legitimate freshman 15 in the NBA. You know, you eat well, there's always food, you're never hungry, you're going to bed late, you're getting up early, you're traveling. <laughs> there's no other way to put it than, you know, you just learn a rhythm. You, you can't come out too hard and try to train seven days a week because you burn out. And it took me a good six months to get into a rhythm where um, I knew when to sleep more, I knew when to train. I knew when to, you know, skip a meal, but it, it just took time. Honestly, it, it's a really good question. That's why I was laughing because we, we joke about it all the time. I guess you guys, the support network within the performance team, has to be tight knit to to get each other through that. To to know when, yeah, like go home a couple of hours early because we know that you need it because you've had that flight there and that flight there. So I suppose it's just that 
internal support mechanism and and like you said the emotional t intelligence of the players but also intel emotional intelligence of the staff to know each other and go i can tell you are struggling get yourself home like we'll see you tomorrow you 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 absolutely nailed it in the head like our group is we we meet every single day even if it's for 10 minutes and and uh we have very good leadership within that group and you know there's days when uh you can just tell somebody needs some time. We say, hey, get out of here. Or, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of off days based off of our schedule, but we'll cycle off days based off of needs. Or, you know, if myself, my, you know, my family, for my first year and part of my second year, they came back and forth from Canada just for, for different reasons. So when they were in town, you know, the group was really receptive. And, you know, I, I took a little bit more time away or, or got out a little bit early and guys would cover and vice versa. You know, we just had two to um, staff within our, our performance group have children just recently, right when the season kicked off. So we've really tried to support them. And, and you know, it, with this environment, if you have a group that you're not enjoying working with and, and, and they don't have each other, we don't have each other's back, it's literally impossible to succeed. Mm -hmm. so, so based on, based on that, <clears throat> based on the, the, I hate to say constraints, cause you know, it's the, it's the sport and it's, it's just how it is and how it's structured. But shifting your perspective or your perception of what ideal is, and I think how I think about that in my head when, when I ask that question, you go through university, you've got all this kind of physiology and everything you, you expect when you go into a professional environment that you run through the logical steps to get some, to improve someone, whether it be strength or whether it be you know conditioning or whatever it may be but in this type in the type of environment that you're talking about does there have to be a shift in okay i know the ideal then how do i mold that into all the things that we've just talked about mm -hmm. which is the mm -hmm. environment and the constraints of the sport yeah absolutely um that's really well said uh you know in school you you, t you take steps to learn um you know linear periodization and what an, a YTP might look like. And those are all incredibly important. You have to understand that. Um, and I've touched on this before, but being in different environments where uh, they prioritize different components uh, of, of, if you want to say stimulus based off, you know, if you're in football, um, you know, the environment lends itself to doing a lot more physical conditioning and e even, you know, type of power and speed work everything's done on field you know and, and and you might get a strength stimulus but it takes time to build that culture and you might get you know a session a week um and, and some other environments you might get two or three but you're not going to load them the same way as you do in a hockey environment so uh you know i started working primarily with development uh an athlete development program for ice hockey and i could you know load them and load them and even when i didn't want to load them they'd, they'd be hungry asking for more and, and so you'd have to pull back and and discuss and, and, and articulate how you want to, you know, shift that. And then that was almost like trying to hold back the athlete. And then in football, initially, you know, it was a great environment, but you had to, you know, engage them a little bit more to load and understand the loading, you know, might not make them slower as long as you're not, you know, you're doing it properly. And then, you know, every environment that we, I was in, I, I learned that um, instead of getting frustrated with not being able to have an ideal, um, you know, structure to, to what I want to do I just tried to shift okay this is this is a paradigm you have to understand your environment and then how do I achieve what I need to achieve first of all and then what I want to achieve given given the environment and then so coming here you know everything we touched on about the, the demands on and off the court in basketball <laughs> you have to be as as organized as possible but as adaptive as possible because um, you're not going to have, you know, a schedule within, you know, past two weeks. It's going to be the way you plan it. It's just, it's just not the way it is. So you shift your ideal um, to understand that that is the environment that we're in, and you, you're constantly organizing and restructuring. But you're, you're always, you know, learning to be adaptive. Like in the moment, as an athlete comes in and says, you know, I played 35 yesterday, but I'd, I'd like to get a a good stimulus and then you have to talk through that and then you know keep them engaged and, and, and work with them on a day-to-day -day basis that's really it's an environment so in terms of the the your practice is there anything that has i suppose come as a surprise in this in this sort of environment 
that you've had to do something that maybe you wouldn't have expected coming into the environment because of because of the constraints that you're in like you say having to be adaptable to the player that comes in after playing 35 he's not down to do his session but he wants to do a session Mm -hmm. is there anything any other examples that you can give us that kind of yeah give us some practical sense of what it's like to be there yes it's that's a really good question i I want to make sure i answer it properly i mean there's there's definitely there's definitely examples i think it's really uh, most coaches they have coaching philosophies and and staples to how they want to deliver their program and everyone you know who's at a high level they, they learn to be adaptable um but they have things that they hang their hat on you know um i used to really like uh, Olympic, Olympic lifting variations. Um, then I realized, you know, in this environment, I probably not, not that you can't do them, but, um, you know, some sessions you have 12 to 14 minutes, you know, 15 minutes before things have to roll, or you might have a lot more time depending on the situation. And then you have to consider, okay, like you would really like to do, you know, hand clean with this athlete for X, Y, Z reasons but what's the risk reward you don't have a lot of time so what are you going to take away from to get those hand cleans in and then uh you have to also consider you know shooting is how these guys make a living so if you have any sort of effect on their wrist or anything like that on the catch it could cost you your job and like not to say there's that type of stress but um there's certain things that i i used to be staples uh, of mine from a programming perspective that i've kind of veered away from just because of time constraints and 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 trying to keep things simple and, and trying to you know grasp the concept of low hanging fruit and, and try to just make sure we get what we need to get in on a regular basis so that we don't fall out of that rhythm. So you mentioned a, a minute ago, I, I wrote it down about changing, knowing what you want to achieve, but potentially changing how you go about doing that. Mm-hmm. So from a from a head performance coach what is it that you want to achieve and the thing that we spoke about beforehand that kind of set the scene for this was can we make our players better or can you make your players better in season because of all the things that we've just spoken about the environment the constraints what is it that you want to achieve what's the core of your day-to-day work that at the end of the season you can say okay i think i think we got there or we need to change things for next season Mm-hmm. Yeah, as simply as simple as you can put it, any on every, any given night, you know there might be fatigue that is out of your control. But on any given night, if a player is called upon, whether he hasn't played in ten games or he's been playing every single day, does he have the physical requirements um, to play? And and, and you know. <laughs> You know, in different sports, you might they might play, but they might play four minutes. A, a player might be, you know, asked of 25 minutes when he hasn't played in two, three weeks. So any given day, are they physically fit enough um, and, and ready to compete if they have to? So that's that's a, a no-brainer. Two is, is have, have do not affect their ability to play. So we have to load them and we have to be strategic in how we load them. But if a player pulls up with a hamstring because, you know, my ego got in the way and I wanted him to push a little bit more weight, like that's my fault. That That is my fault. Um, so making sure that, you know, what we're doing off court isn't affecting what they're doing on court because the demands are already high enough. And then obviously game availability is, is key. So making sure that um, if they do miss time, uh, they miss the least amount of time that they need to and then they're available for as many games as possible. That, that's a simple way to put it. Um, I think where we're going to go with this is um, how, and uh, again, it's different environments you learn. And, and when I was, it, to be to be honest, like when I was in soccer initially, I was like, how, how are we not loading these guys more? Um, and I had a, a good friend and mentor there who, who just, he had played soccer, and but he was really proficient in the weight room. And he said little bits often. And sometimes we'd start with, you know, Two, three, two, three sets of two and three, you know, you know, six to nine reps. And I'm like asking myself at this young age, like, what are we going to achieve here? Honestly. And then three, four months later, that same athlete, 
know, has had these, these physical gains in season because they went from never having true exposure in the weight room to consistently microdosing some real strength, you know, primaries and, and getting confident in there and suddenly you can load them the way you need to load them. But it's just taking time. So it's like it's just understanding that, you know, the concept of Kaizen and, and making sure you're just chipping away little little bits every day and microdosing, making sure you're getting the absolute needs, but then being patient with the gains that you're trying to achieve and understanding it's it's, it's not a four week block. I know we're gonna come on to this later, but I think we're we're here now, so we'll we'll tackle yeah. it. But yeah. the, the the programming and the, the microdosing can you give us some examples of what that looks like? Like how are you, for, you talked about your move away from or move away from the emphasis of Olympic lifts. Mm -hmm. How have mm -hmm. you integrated that? What, what changes have you made there? What does the microdosing look like from a, on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, all that stuff, yeah, some examples would be, would be great. Yeah, um, and I and I do want to be clear. Like I, I am a big fan of Olympic lifts, and and when when the the time is appropriate, um, we, we you know I'd like to use it. It's just it's, it's challenging in this environment, and um and, and there is obviously a, a huge technical learning curve. So that's another factor. A lot of these guys, they're to be honest, they're they're a bit um, weary of it because they did it in college a ton. So um, that's just the Olympic uh, lifting piece. Micro Dosing, honestly, like to keep it as simple as possible, if you can get, you know, a relative max strength stimulus for high minute player once a week, um, and you know, um, if they're not getting the speed power exposure off court, you can you can work it into pregame sessions. So we'll, we'll call them potentiation sessions. But um, on a regular or semi semi regular basis, we'll get some form of uh, speed power work before the game, just to make them, you know, one give them that potentiation effect, but also chip away at getting some volume of, of, of quality work before they go into those environments. So that's, that's been a big one, whether it's med ball work or a, a speed trap bar or a squat jump, it, it depends on the athlete. Um, but that's, you know, two, three, two, three games a day or uh, two, three games a week. We'll get that as long as they're not under a fatigue state. Um, we've had a great little culture of, of getting in again. It's not a, a ton, but a, a 12, 14, 15 minute lift post game. Uh, if guys are, are feeling up to it and and um, and we you know we've got the music going and it might be you know if we have a dense uh, training or a, a de dense week of games we, we might not you know stay away from knee dominant exercises or exercises that are gonna uh, accumulate more fatigue on, on the knees and the Achilles and calves but we might still get that strength stimulus um, as we flow through uh, and then versus a week where we have uh, say two games or or we have three games, but then we have a day off and a practice day, so we have 72 hours between games. We'll load them, you know. We'll take we'll take care of that window and 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 perhaps go more knee dominant, go work in some eccentric type style, uh, style work, so so they can they can get that stimulus, but also have time to recover and not not affect their games. Is that planned beforehand? I'm just thinking of the like the microdosing post game. Absolutely. Okay. It's, yeah, I'm just in my in my head. Yeah. I'm thinking, put myself in that environment. If I win and play well, yeah, I'm lifting. I'm yeah. feeling good. I'm in there. But that's planned beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, the we all the way we do here is our, our performance coaches. There's uh, four of us, um, and and there's myself, and then there's um, three other individuals who are performance coaches. One is more involved with nutrition. One's more involved with the sports science. One's more is actually a duel with uh, athletic therapists. But we all have um, people who are re responsible for, so we have more contact points with those athletes. And that way, you, there is that individualization piece. But we all, you know, every two days before a week starts, we'll sit down and we'll discuss the week. You know, um, how many games do we have? What does our travel look like? Um, you know, what does this player need, you know, through our evaluations like are they training upwards or downwards and then we'll we'll put together a, a pretty comprehensive plan we'll we'll adapt it for the individual and then based off of their minutes based off of our conversations with them um again we might pull a lift we might shift a lift to the morning we might add load we might uh you know modify it so there's no eccentric component like if you're doing an rdl you might just just do like a rack pull or or have them drop the bar just to you know 
make little modifications, but make sure we're still getting that type of work in. Is there any reason, I mean, there is a reason clearly, but can you explain the reason why you wouldn't do the eccentric part of the RDL? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's honestly just the, the delayed, you know, depending on the load that they're doing, um, there, there's certain players who can pull a lot of weight, but they get that, that additional um, soreness at that 48 hour mark with, with the eccentric components. So uh, you can still, you know, get a response. You can still give the athlete confidence that they're still lifting, but then also reduce that by a little bit, depending on the volume that you're doing, reduce that that soreness or that fatigue that could come from that. So would you place that then somewhere else in the program that's more appropriate if there is a little bit of soreness? Because obviously, the, yeah. while you're doing so, it, you're going to get used to so it. That's, that, that's a, it depends on the athlete. So we, we're fortunate that we have we have 15 players. Um, we have a really beautiful facility. We have everything you could ask for. So. When we have players who have spent two, three, four, like with COVID a lot more than that, but say two months with us prior to season, we know exactly where that athlete is. And our goal is to maintain the gains that they've made in that off season. So that athlete typically will feel much, far more comfortable loading them frequently um, before a game doesn't matter. It's almost like a preventative and, and pot like potentiation effect. And then you have other athletes who, are still you know, coming in physically prepared, but we haven't had contact points with them. We don't know how they lift. They might be new to the roster. We'll definitely take a very simple is better approach and, and just, you know, I'll go back to days where you might, you might do, you know, two sets of three and see how things go um, and then progress from there. So it really depends on how much time we've had with the athlete, how articulate they are with us, how confident they are in the weight room, how confident we are with how they are in the weight room, et cetera. I suppose uh, the next point is coming from my perception of the collegiate system over there and my perception that they come through that system having been coached well, you know, used to being in the weight room and they come to you guys and it's just uh, almost a continuation of, of what's been going on through college. Is that mm -hmm. me just been very idealistic? Is that the kind of, is that what, is that how it is? <clears throat> well, I only have a little bit of experience because I'm, I went to a Canadian university. I think it really depends on, you know, the, the collegiate system, they do, they, they work really hard and, and they're responsible for a lot of athletes, most of these guys and um, all of, most of them, you know, they've had experiences um, that have, you know, primed them for that. But in the NBA, it's a bit different where a lot of players play one season in college. Okay. Um, and they're, they're playing a ton. So they might not have that extended training age um, from, you know, a four years college for, for other sports. Um, and it depends what school they go to. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying some schools are better than others, but uh, depending on who's running your program, they're, they're going to have very, very, very different approaches. Cool. Load management is the next topic that I want to. Uh, that that's, your to favorite, that's your favorite. That's favorite, your favorite term, right? Favorite little term. Yeah, drag that bad boy out every now and again. <laughs> so yeah. So in terms of that that phrase, I know it's got it's made its way into the media, and it's people seem to be talking about it a lot in various different mm -hmm. different contexts, different situations. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? And how do you? How do you manage load? Not load management, but how do you manage load for the guys that are on the court a lot, but also the guys that aren't on the court a lot? Yes. Um, I. <laughs> yeah, the term the term load management is thrown out a ton, and uh, it means different things to different people. Uh, for me, load management is it's not rest. It, it could mean rest. But it's, you know, what is the, the number one indicator for a good injury prevention program is slowly and progressively building a really high chronic load for, for these athletes in their training environment. So if you can, you know, get to a point where you're safely, you safely have a high training load to play hockey, to play basketball, to play whatever you do, you know, to run, um, that's your, that with a good sound, you know, strength program and nutrition program is your staple to stay healthy. So load management is, is a strategy to try to minimize injury. Um, so when I hear load management, most people, or not most people, a lot of people, they'll say, okay, just rest them and sit. And for me, it's, it's not, 
it, it can be a lot more, you know, if an athlete doesn't have a high chronic training load, it's, it's being smart and not putting them in, in challenging environments where um, they haven't built up that capacity. And then, you know, you might take them out of that environment, but then you might still load them um, where they don't have the risk factors that are more associated with those injuries. So load them where there's no decision making, but you can still get them in the weight room or you might have somebody who has degenerative changes or, or joint issues where, you know, their ability to play, you know, 70 minutes cumulative basketball is very challenging. In that case, again, you know, rest might be important, but often it's not that they need rest, it's that they need a different type of stimulus to support them. Um, whether it's, you know, VFR or different modalities. It, long story short is, is lo load management is, is, is not rest and that's what kills me. And it can be rest, like, don't get me wrong, but it's not just like, you know, players are sitting in the background eating popcorn because they don't want to play basketball. It's, it's, they want to, they want to play and they want to compete. And, um, it's just a strategy to make sure they have longevity in their career in that season and to help the team win. And, and that's really what it is. Load management for the guys that are playing looks like, looks differently to load management for the guys that aren't playing. Cause they're yes. going to need, they're going to need extra load management means actually more, not yeah. less. Exactly. Exactly. You nailed it. Yeah. So how do how do you manage them guys that that I suppose that group down from the the regular starters the, the high minute guys mm -hmm. how do you manage them and mm -hmm. do what you said at the start which was ensure that they're ready to go even if they haven't played for two weeks three weeks mm -hmm. four weeks they can get back. Well, in the yeah, Lorena Lorena Torres her her podcast she touched on a really a lot of good points of working really closely with coaches and trying to educate and and collaborate with them to to build in a lot of the the, the fitness and conditioning required into drills so that's always the goal like um anytime we can we're, we're fortunate again our our coaching staff is um so open-minded and articulate and are, sorry not articulate they are articulate but so <laughs> open-minded and accept, accepting of what we have to say and and, and if they don't understand something um, they ask questions, and if we don't understand something, we can ask questions. It's an open, it's an open book, and and we, you know sometimes we're on court with them, so it's really it's 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 planning, uh, and and discussing with the 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 director of player development and 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 the team, and and find a little bit, you know, if, if players are, are aren't meant to play a lot of minutes, then how can we strategically work in drills or 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 small sided games, you know, prior to game, post game. Um, the day before or the d next day after practice. Um, and then, you know, we'll probably on a weekly basis, we'll have an outline and then we'll modify it based off of the results and, and how coach wants to, to transition um, the game tactically and, and from a staffing perspective. How big is that tactical component for how you would condition those guys on that second layer or even the third layer down? Can you, can you, sorry, did you, yeah, you how, how would, how much influence would the technical and the, and I suppose the game, the game strategy that your coaches implement, how much mm -hmm. of an effect would that have on how you condition the players, whether it be small sided games, you know, manipulating certain things to then get that certain technical or tactical yes. input, that yeah. little drip with, but within a, within a physical conditioning session. Yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. It, it really, you don't want to hear this, but it, it depends, you know, at times it's old school, but they might have a very, very tactical, really non-physically loading section. And then we just have to work in fitness in between um, or, or do fitness after there's times where, you know, um, the, the t as a team, they might go over strategies. So then when they're, when, you know, the, the, the group that's not playing or doing a small side of games, coaches will try to take those strategies and transfer into the, into those drills. Um, as much as possible, our, our coaches are always trying to make sure, make sure that that's being, you know, brought home. And, and, and when we're doing extra, extra work, it's not just for the physical, it's for the physical, the mental, the tactical, the technical, kind of hit all four performance pillars. One thing I'd, I'd written down, I didn't get to during on the programming side of things was, was isometrics. And that's something that has probably been multiple full circles of popularity and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and presence on social media. 
And I'm just wondering what what impact or what influence isometrics has on your yeah. programming. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's oh, sorry. It's uh, a little bit often, but it's it's often it's important. I mean, if you look at uh, if you work back from the sport, you know, basketballs are really there's not a lot of real estate. Um, I, I stole that term from David Taylor. Uh, a lot of real estate. There's not a lot of space. A ton of accelerations, decelerations, um, and a tremendous amount of load on 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 the Achilles, knees. You know, it works all the way up. But if you look at um, our in, injury data in the league, you know, if you take out you know ankles and and, and knees, it, you're you're in a much better shape. So, bulletproofing those puppies is like a, it's it's a number one. That's a like, we talk about the concept of low hanging fruit. Um, ways that you can frequently you know bulletproof and it's not bulletproofing but just helping you know create some real uh, resiliency for those two points um and not take away from their ability to be on court that's the that's a no-brainer so it's it's something that you know most environments are, are working in a, on, a, on a, a pretty high frequency but it, it again it depends on the athlete um so if if we have guys who who spend a lot of time with us in the off season you, you build up a decent tolerance, you can, you can actually load that and, 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 you know, it can start from there or it can start from a body weight, you know, a body weight isometric and then, and then work towards something where you're actually getting the loading required um, for the tendon loading. Um, but, you know, even isometric, like a, even days where we have, we want to get a strength stimulus and you have a density of games, you can look at working in um, concentric only phase or isometric lower body load thing where you're still getting recruitment but you're not getting um, the DOMS or anything like that that might affect them the following days. So you can be pretty creative with programming, one for um, to get in your injury prevention style work as well as for evaluation, which is uh, really important for this environment because you don't have as much time as you'd like on a day-to-day -day basis. So bulletproofing, the, the ankle and the knee, is there any particular strategies that you use barring what we've already discussed that you could possibly dive into that you may use to, to go about that from an injury, preven inj injury prevention but increasing performance as well? Uh, I mean, I, I'd like to tell you I have like a, a secret potion for this, but I, it, it's, it's as simple, yeah. simple as best, you know. If, 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 if a player is comfortable with a shuttle, you use a shuttle. If, if they've done lots of it, you can you can you can load them in a pin squat or uh, uh, not a pin squat. Just uh, you can you can load them isometrically, you know, in a stride position. We we try to keep it fresh for them too, so that that you know they're comfortable with it. But um, you know, we might have four or five different um, ways we load it. You know, different ways to skin the cap. But the, the, at the end of the day, we're just keeping it simple and and just making sure that we're getting it in. You know, one to three times a week and. And building on building on it so they're not you know if they're on a shuttle and, and they've been doing 80 pounds six months from there you know hopefully they're not doing 80 pounds for the same time you can kind of progress that how do you evaluate so coming to the end of the season now we're, we're nowhere near that right we're nowhere near that right now but come the end of the season how do you evaluate what's gone on previously and whether you guys have been successful or whether you can take certain things forward, whether certain things have to be changed. What's that process look like? I know we've had pretty, a quick turnaround of of, um, of that kind of process not too long ago. So it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to see if that's, mm -hmm. you know, what that process looks like for you guys. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean uh, you, you mean from our, our group, like the performance staff? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, we we take player feedback um, really seriously. So um, a, a long conversation, I mean, long can be 10 minutes, can be 45 minutes, but sitting down and really talking to an athlete um, prior to the season and at the end of the season is, is a, a big staple because, you know, data is important. Like, don't get me wrong, but um, if you sit down with an athlete and, and, and they, they verbalize what their goals are for a season and at the end of the year, they've achieved them, um, you know, what has provided them with the tools to succeed? You know, have we helped them? Do we need to change something? How did you feel, you know, what we provided? Like, how, how did you feel that, you know, that helped you or that, that hindered you? If they came in and, um, 
they had all these goals and none of them were achieved. Why not? You know, were they disengaged? Did they have, um, you know, issues off the court that kind of limited them? Did we hurt them? You know, were they not, you know, what is, what is the issue? And that, that's honestly probably the single most important um, is, is talking to them. And then of course we, we gather a, quite a bit of information on a regular basis, but it's not cumbersome. It's kind of tied into our process, whether it's, force plate jumps or some some watt bike um, testing or body weight body comp things like that um, to support but not to to you know give a black or white you know answer have I done my job you mentioned the watt bike testing mm -hmm. is that something that you could expand on and this the only reason I ask is that it, it hasn't come up very often Mm -hmm. But there's one particular conversation that it did come up with the with, uh, head of performance in the Premier League probably five or six years ago. And I'm interested to see mm -hmm. how that mm -hmm. thinking has, made, has developed and why you would use it and what it tells you. Yeah, um, there, there's there's a, a few people who, I've, who uh, I know who, who kind of utilize it or, or some version of it. I'll be honest, we had a... a a really intelligent physiologist with the Whitecaps who who shared that as a key strategy when he was working with athletes and and so I I, I looked into it and I really liked it and and you know you can do a safe you can safely measure uh, an athlete's output and obviously there is a learned effect on a bike if you're not used to being on a bike it's it's a bit different but if you get enough data points where um, you can look at you know what their peak wattage and their average wad wattage is you can get a decent picture. Uh, of where they're sitting. If there is fatigue and, and the athlete's giving you um, a, a true effort, like that's, it's pretty clear, you know, or, or if you haven't been loading or if you've been loading too much and there's some neuromuscular fatigue, it, it's, it's going to, it's going to be there. So it's just, it's a way to get a, a, some data points um, and also not have the athlete feel like they're being um, evaluated 24 seven mm -hmm. because it, you can use it for a primer. You know, you can do five sets of it and then change the resistance on the walk bike. So there's, you know, more of a, a speed or a velocity component, more of a force component. It's not force because it's, it's really not a lot of load, but you can put it as part of their training. And so, you know, we're getting information. The athlete feels like, you know, they're prepping themselves for practice for a game. So it's kind of a win-win. So we used to do super, super short, like six seconds, five seconds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So is, is there any other regular testing that you guys do that that do st does start to inform programming and all the things that we've we've discussed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we um, like a lot of clubs, uh, the force plates are a key yeah. key variable or a, a key um, testing measure that we use pretty quite frequently off season, even more so. Um, if if the players are willing, it's obviously you know they have to be wanting to do it because the effort is, is the most important thing. But um, force plates are key, walk bike, body weight. Body weight's an important one, especially with the travel and the lifestyle. Um, it's important to, to track that and, and body composition on a regular basis. But those are um, most of our key key staples. We can't wear GPS in games. Um, and, and honestly, like GPS utilization as a league is is, you know, it's not – it's growing, but it's not what it is in, in the EPL or, or things like that. So, um, but we do have um, a second spectrum for, for game data. So uh, we, we have, you know, six or seven different, different key tools that we use, um, but our strategy is never to allow the evaluation to hinder from the athletes um, day to day, just because coming back to the point, it's like they have so much on their plate already that it's not going to be successful if, if we say, hey, you know, we need 20, 20 minutes of your time to get this evaluation in. I've got one more question for you before I let you go, because I know you've taken mm -hmm. time out right in the middle of your day. Mm -hmm. Jumping and the management of, of jumping, and everyone wants that extra inch of jump height, but because they're doing so much jumping in the game, how do you then manage that and – alternatives potentially to, to get that extra and increase their performance mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. adding to the overall load that they're already exposed to. What does that, where's your mind at with that? At this level, at this level, honestly, there's very, very few 
there's very few athletes who jump under 30 inches. There's very few, you know, um, and that's, that's the reality. That's, you know, a simple KPI, but it's risk reward. So at this level to have an athlete jump higher, unless they're, you know, a first or second year athlete, um, or they're, they're really low on, on the athletic skill, which is, you know, when we would typically focus on off season anyways, but in season, um, honestly, I, I want to be careful because there are times where we want to work on athleticism as we roll through it. But in season, rarely are we going to have situations because of the, the population that we work with where it's absolutely necessary for them to jump, you know, yeah. an inch or two higher over the next two month period. So yeah. um, jump count is used um, at some capacity in, in different environments. Um, the NBA, even the way you, you structure practice, like, again, I, I keep coming back to how football is football you know, you play the game, but uh, you have a rhythm of training and, and your training sessions can be quite challenging. And, and it's the same thing in the NBA, but because of our, our game density, um, you don't tend to have, you know, really long, high volume, high intensity sessions on a regular basis. So you you, you definitely track what, what you're doing on, on non-game days, but it, it's a little bit less of a emphasis as compared to, you know, different environments. Cool. Um, did I? Yeah, I answered that question. Yeah, no, I thought I was missing something there. No, no, you're all, you're all good. You're all good. Like like I say, I know you've taken an hour out of your mid afternoon to uh, to come and have a chat. So I'm going to let you shoot back. I know you you dive into a room to uh, to get on the video as well. So I appreciate it. But Carl, if anyone's got any questions about your your work, background, careers, etc., where's the best place for for someone to get in touch? You know. I'm not, I don't really have a social media, like I have social media, but I'm, I'm not, I don't have, I don't have a big presence. So <laughs> I'll, uh, maybe I, I'll send you uh, my email and then you can just yeah. add it to the podcast and maybe that's yeah. the best way to go about it. Yeah. Have you got a, are you on LinkedIn? No. Nope. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No okay. Facebook. I, I have Instagram and, and Twitter, but it's ma mainly photos of my, my kids. Yeah. Good call. Great call. Yeah. Like say, my hero. <laughs> So we'll we'll shall link to I'll, I can link to LinkedIn that might be the easiest one and email us maybe yeah for sure Legend. and uh, thank you for your time I've 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 liked your podcast for a really long time so it's excited to to be able to share pleasure it's what this is about I mean we we spoke for we spoke uh, last night we we spoken before this lining it up and it's 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 great to speak to people like yourself who are doing the work that you're doing and uh, and then make it formal in the form of a podcast. So I appreciate your time, mate. So it's great to catch up.